Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us online as we gather as God's people here at Pine Town Baptist. It's good to be back with God's people in his house, and we are thanking the Lord for this privilege to once again be able to meet. We continue to pray for increased freedom for the church so that we might worship the Lord truly in spirit and in truth. This morning, we're going to carry on in our series on the parables uh, that we've been doing for the last nearly six months now. Uh, We're not quite there to exhausting every last parable, and we don't plan on getting to every last one, although we're close. Um, Just a few more parables of our Lord are left, and I want to do it for this Sunday and two more. Uh, Two out of the three will be dealing with the end times. Uh, This one will. And then next week, we're going to look at that famous parable on Lazarus and Dives, and then we'll finish up with the separating of the sheep and the goats. But for this morning, I want to look at the parable that's found in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. That parable is, I'm calling it, parables of the parable of the bags of gold. Uh, in your Bibles, it might very well be the parable of the talents, but I want to speak about that title because it's important. Most of the time when we see something like the parable of the talents, uh, we're thinking in terms of giftedness. We're thinking in terms of skills. Uh, that person can play the piano or sing. Uh, They're very talented. Uh, This individual is a a seamstress. She's amazing at sewing and putting together uh, clothing. Um, She's very talented, very gifted, uh, uh, a person in sport. Uh, In whatever activity, these are gifted people, talented. Well, that's not what this is talking about. Jesus is describing in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, in the parable of the talents, which I think is more descriptive to call it the parable of the bags of gold, Uh, He's talking about uh, the talent is a unit of weight, uh, particularly when it comes to money. It's a monetary unit of weight, either in silver or in gold. But Jesus is describing, the the word is talenton in Greek, so you can see why they just simply translated it talents. But it's a heavy weight. It's, quite frankly, it's massive weight. Uh, A denarius was a day's wage for a soldier, common day laborer. They would be given a denarius coin, as the fruit of their labor. But when it comes to a talent, (laughs) we're talking about 6,000 days of labor. Approximately 20 years of hard labor to receive a talent of gold. Uh, So it's a bag of gold. (laughs) Um, And and therefore, uh, what Jesus is talking about here in this parable is a very, very large sum of money that he that the master in this story is distributing among his slaves. And that's the other point that I want to make. Usually, and including in my version that I'm looking at this morning, in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, uh, it describes his servants, the master's servants, putting his bags of gold to work. But in actual fact, the word doulos, which we normally translate servant, actually the word is slave, and nothing but a slave. These are people who are under the employ of the master, but they actually are owned by the master. And so with that in mind, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the, 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 the scriptures before us this morning. And then we're going to ask for the Lord to give us clarity and understanding as to what he is wanting to teach us through this quite interesting and surprising parable. Let's, let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this time to be with God's people, to finally meet again in God's house. What a pleasure. Now we thank you and once again pray for the British laws and the baptism that took place last week and we pray for a continued blessing to flow to that home for having obediently entered into the waters of baptism. But now as we focus in uh, once again on parables, uh, it's our prayer that you would enlighten us to understand what you were wanting to say to us, Lord Jesus, in order that the application would be such that God's people would be greatly improved and helped that we would all be trained up in righteousness, that we would be shaped by the word of God, and that our souls would be prepared for the time when we shall see the Master in his glory, face to face. And we would thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bibles, would you, to Matthew 25. We're looking at verses 14 through 30, 
And right now, let's have a look at verses 14 and 15. Again, it will be like a man going out on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. This master is leaving. He's heading off somewhere, and we don't know, but it tells us in a few more verses that he's going to be away a long time. Well, it doesn't take a Christian, being a Christian for very long, to understand that Jesus is actually talking about himself. He's coming to visit us here on planet Earth. He is going to uh, do mighty miracles and teach his word, and he's going to explain the gospel, and he's going to bring and usher in the kingdom of God on Earth to take this world back for himself. But he's only going to be here for a short while. And then he's heading back to heaven. And so as he leaves, he entrusts this kingdom into the hands of his slaves, his disciples, his people. Now we need to understand something about the people to whom the Lord is entrusting these precious bags of gold. What he's handing over to them is truly precious. It's the kingdom. It's the, the word of God. It's, it's the importance of spreading the good news of the gospel. There, there's the spiritual application. But he's also making an assessment. Uh, this master, according to this text, is wanting to distribute some of his wealth. Not all of it, but he's entrusting his wealth to these different slaves to whom he's, he's come into greater and greater confidence. Now, we need to understand why they translated it servant. It's all because of our, the background of slavery in our mind. We think normally of African slavery, either heading on off to where, where so many were kidnapped from the eastern continent of Africa and taken off into the Arab countries, and when they were no longer of any use, were simply uh, slaughtered. Or the more familiar western slavery, where boats, boatloads of people were kidnapped and chained and were handed over to be taken off to Western Europe or to America. And and it's that kind of thought process that goes on in our minds when we think in terms of slavery. But in the time of Jesus, slavery was immensely common. Perhaps 80% of any population, maybe even 90% of a population would be slaves. What that meant was that you fell into one of three categories. Either you were a nobleman, like this man, this wealthy fellow was, or you were a free man, you had purchased your freedom or you had received it by citizen rights, or thirdly, you were a slave. And sometimes very, very well-educated people, uh, people who were flying high, doing well, suddenly ran into economic ruin, made bad investment choices. There was a famine, perhaps. Their crops were destroyed, and they discovered themselves penniless. Well, at a time like that, all that a person could do, there was no social security. There was no backup help coming from anywhere. Uh, No government assistance. Nobody was going to come out and and give you a handout. So what happened was you you were forced to sell yourself and your family into slavery. And so uh, you would have Italians who were noblemen, freedmen, and slaves. You would have Englishmen, noblemen, freedmen, slaves. You'd have African Noblemen, freemen, slaves. So uh, where you fell was not based on ethnicity. Where, Where you fell was just based on economic reality. And so it would not be uncommon for a wealthy man like this to have slaves who were much better educated, even perhaps more clever when it comes to handling finance. Um... He was taking a look at these guys, and some of them, through no fault of their own, had become broke. The famine had swept away their land and killed off their animals. So here he is with these different uh, individuals who he's entrusting bags of gold with because he's heading off, and he wants them to keep on uh, promoting his own well-being. He He wants even more wealth. So he's making an assessment, each according to the man's ability, verse 14 and 15 tell us. So he's taking a look at these three guys, and he's saying, I think with that fellow, I know how clever he is. I'm going to give him five bags of gold. This other fellow is clever, but I don't trust him like I do the first guy. Uh, I'm going to give him two bags of gold. And to the third fellow, he's, t- <laughs> he's made several blunders that I've noticed, but uh, I'm going to give him an opportunity. And so here, 
here's a bag of gold. Now, when you understand that it's either a bag of gold or a bag of silver, you realize this is no small amount of money. This guy's wealthy. He's not entrusting everything. He's giving, if it's a bag of silver in today's standards, that five bags is five million U.S. dollars. If it's the guy with the two bags, two million bucks. The, the guy with the one, it's a million bucks. If it's gold, <laughs> the ratio is 80 to one. So it's 80 times five. Somebody help me. Four hundred million dollars. Two bags, 160 million U.S. bucks. Uh, the one guy, just a measly 80 million dollars. So then multiply that and, to, well, no, never mind. Uh, you know where I'm, uh, forget, it, forget about that. I, I can't even think that high. Okay, so you've got, you've got these three fellas that have been handed uh, large sums of, of gold or, or silver. And he's telling them, put that money to work. Now, let me keep going just for a few more minutes on this. Uh, these fellas are not going to just be able to put it in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and sit back. Uh, or, or the New York Stock Exchange, or the London FTSE. It's, it's not going there, because there's no such entity that exists. These guys are going to have to be clever. Uh, the money is going to have to go into buying a farm, uh, buying cattle. It's going to have to be the startup of a, of a bakery, a, a factory that makes um, leather, leather goods. And, and these guys have responsibility now. I mean, this is going to be an enterprise. These guys are going to have to be on top of their game in order to get things done with the money that's been entrusted to them. This master is expecting results. These are slaves, and they need to produce the goods, and they better put all of their mental acumen to work to make this happen. And, and so he says, put this money to work, and when I come back, let's see how you do. And so then the story goes on. Let's take a look now at verses 16 through 18. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. Uh, so also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. We got a problem. Uh, you've got fellas who are active, but you've got this third guy who refuses to get involved. What's going on? Uh, this guy takes the, this third guy takes the money and just buries it in the ground. The first two are active, and they get to work right away. I mean, it says at once. These guys did not waste any time taking what had been given to them, and they knew that when the master got back, they would need to produce results. Now, what would motivate a person to be so active so quickly? Well, the reason to be active and to get going is you have to have a relationship with the master. The relationship has to be such that you are keen to produce results. Uh, we can say that these slaves understood that their master was a generous man. He was bequeathing them with large responsibility. There was a love relationship going on here. I mean, people that are going to get to work at once with these bags of gold are people who want to produce results for the praise that they will receive from the master. Now, Jesus is talking about servants. We, it's an easy application, is it not? God's people are, are wanting to get to work for Jesus. He has come and brought his kingdom down to earth. He's called upon us to repent and to get started in the kingdom life. Now he, he gives us responsibilities to perform. And those responsibilities are to be performed for the praise of the master when he returns. The clear-thinking Christian is wanting to be in the top form. You want to be with this guy that's being bequeathed with large responsibilities, but large or small, you want to be faithful. You want to be responsible. But this third fellow, that's a whole other story. And he has a different view of this master as we carry on in our passage. Let's take a look at verses 17, uh, I'm sorry, verses 19 and 20. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. Quite a story. The master's been away a long time. Uh, far longer than we could have ever imagined. But he's been gone. 
and he's left on his journey and hasn't returned for a very long time, like 2,000 years, right? Um, he thankfully gave us signs and warnings that he would be returning, where there would be the oppression of the church suddenly and unexpectedly, uh, where God's people would be called upon either to resist or to conform. It, it, there was no question that there would be birth pangs, no doubt about that. But also, uh, what we have here uh, is, a, is a guy that wants to receive the well done. He's, he's keen, and so he's, he's earnest and anxious to actually show his master that uh, he has produced results, results that, that honor uh, the, the, the master. And, 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 the, and this guy has been industrious. And when he's called to account, he gladly turns over what has been accomplished. Well, what's amazing here is the response of the master, which we see in verses uh, 21 and 22. Let's have a look. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Well, that's quite a surprise. There's two things that are really surprising here. Not only is this man being commended, but he's actually being told that he is now going to share in the bounty. He says, you've been responsible in a few things. Well, what are you talking about? A few things. This man has just taken $400 million and turned it into $800 million. Are you saying that those are a few things? Apparently, for this master, that's pocket change. This guy's wealthy. This guy must own a cattle on a thousand hills. And he is saying to this slave, and he is a slave, and nothing other than a slave, he's saying to this slave, well done, good and faithful servant, good and faithful slave. You've been faithful with a few things, just pocket change in my mind. I will put you in charge of many things. You know what that's saying? That's saying that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived the good things that the Lord has in store for those who love him. You've got no idea, brother. You've got no idea, sister, what is awaiting those who faithfully serve this master. When he hands over responsibility to you, you have no idea what the response of this generous, gracious, compassionate master will be for those who are faithful in what they are called to do. Well, what is it that the Lord has called you to do? They say, well, the Lord hasn't made me Billy Graham. He hasn't given me a large work to do. But I'm telling you, you've got more responsibility than you could ever imagine. You have children if you're married, perhaps. A wife, a husband. If you're single, you have relationships and your witness as a single person. You have your job and how you respond on the workplace. You have your witness there. Do they know that you are a Christian? Or is your gospel witness been buried in the ground. We've got no idea. All that the church is called upon to do, the mighty church of which the gates of hell cannot prevail, we have no idea how important it is for us to be faithful when it comes to being faithful to this master and honoring him above others. Well, it carries on. He says, after he says, well done, good and faithful servant, he says... <laughs> Come and share in your master's happiness. What does that mean? You know, for so many people, the picture of heaven is floating around on a cloud, strumming a harp. Unbelievable boredom. You can hardly imagine really wanting to go there. It's such a dry, drab, quite frankly, after a million years, just bundle up my coffin. I mean, hopeless. You're laughing because that's what you have thought at times. Or, perhaps even worse, all you do is just sing all day long. And you're not that great a singer. And you're singing before the throne and it never ends. 
I'm telling you 24-7. What if I give you a different picture of heaven? A new heaven and a new earth where God comes and burns up like a, and rolls up like a scroll this old earth that's contaminated and polluted. And then he recreates it and refashions it to look like the Garden of Eden, only better because Christ is the light of such a place. And in the new heavens and in the new earth, you not only sing with glad hearts to your Savior who died for you and suffered and bled on your behalf, but now that he has made you a, a slave, you are now sharing in the bounties of that new heaven and new earth, and you have responsibility like you've never had before, all to honor the king. Busy? You think you're busy now? In the new heavens and in the new earth, it's 24-7. You don't sleep. You don't slumber. You're going to be creative and using your mind, transformed and sanctified and renewed. And so the image of heaven is one of activity and joy and blessing and God's people hugging each other and seeing their full transformed faces and not being afraid. That's the new heavens and the new earth. Does that interest you? What you delight in most in this life and what you find most satisfying is what you will be doing a million times over in the new heavens and in the new earth. And we will be changed. We'll have Christ's thoughts after him and not the thoughts of this world. And we will no longer be terrorized by the invisible and the imaginary and the hocus, and the hoax, and the falsehoods. We're going to live in the truth of Christ and Him alone. Well, let's carry on. Let's see what else is in store. In verses 22 and 23, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You know, I picture this slave as having been surprisingly faithful to his master. Uh, the fellow that, that got the five bags was very clever and he knew it. Uh, that slave knew what he was doing. This guy, we wasn't sure... But he, he thought he could count on him, and oh, was he happily pleased with this slave. He's doubled it. Not as, not as difficult as doubling five bags, but still difficult. And he has been busy and faithful. And I thought, Lord, what, 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 what about this guy with the two bags? What, what's his life look like? And he says, well, it looks a lot more like yours than the guy with five bags. I haven't given you very much to do in comparison to that guy. But you were faithful in your home. Your kids knew where you stood. And as far as spiritual growth, you were growing. You, you, you didn't just read the word and think that you had done your bit, but you studied to see what it said in order that you might apply it. So that the fruit of the Spirit, the joy and the patience and the peace, uh, the peace and the, <coughs> the, the brotherly kindness and the self-control was increasingly in evidence in your life so that you were producing fruit. People knew that you were a Christian. On the job, you were faithful and didn't cheat your boss. And also your children. They knew, Dad, they knew, Mom, where you stood. And you gave them every opportunity and you prayed hard for their salvation. And, and there's the fruit of your labors. Oh, I'm telling you, well done. You see, serving Jesus is a 24-7 happy, glorious thing. These two were thrilled <laughs> at the privilege. Which makes me ask the question, are, if you are a Christian today, <clears throat> are, you, are you glad to be serving Jesus? Is there joy in serving Jesus all along the way? Is Christianity a joy? Is the burden light? Is the yoke of being a slave of Christ easy for you? Does it make you happy? Do you live to glorify the King? Then well done. And anticipate it and pursue it. But now we come to the bad news. 
we come to this wicked slave that we see now in verses 24 and 25. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Well, this guy was scared that he might lose what he had been given. So he thought to himself, the best thing to do with this fellow's money is just to bury it, get it well hidden. That way I can always recover it when he does, if he ever does come back, and I'll give it back to him. This man's perception of the master is quite different than the two fellows, the other two slaves, that's for sure. This third slave had a completely different idea of the character of his master. He was quite insightful, he thought. He could see that his master behind the smokescreen of niceness and generosity was a hard man who exacted from his servants and his slaves, told them to hand over their money, uh, demanded time and resources, who, who refused himself to work but required it of his slaves. This guy had his master all figured out. And therefore, the best that this master deserved was to hide the bag of gold in the ground. I knew you were a hard man. I knew that working for you was a drudgery. And I knew that you reaped where you did not sow. You gathered where you had not scattered seed. And so let me not have to even begin to think in terms of doing something productive for this fellow. So he just hides this gospel narrative. Well, what do you do with a fellow like that? I mean, what's the thinking? I mean, if this guy, by the way, is a servant, he may have had some sort of leg to stand on. We may have even sympathized with him. There's the potential of losing it. And so you've got to make a decision about it. But we once again are reminded that this man is not even a servant. He is a slave. And what slaves do is their master's bidding. This is a guy who is to get on with the job. He has been commissioned with a task. And if he does not obey, well, in those days, that was the death sentence. You could execute a slave who was lazy or wicked or arrogant. And in fact, that's what Jesus is telling us now in these final verses, that he will do. To the person who comes and hears the gospel, receives it, ponders it, gives it some thought, and then just says, I'll look at that again another day. I'm not even interested in letting my light shine because I don't think it's worth going to the bother. This is a lazy and wicked servant whose heart is simply not in it. He's just not that interested. He's got other interests. He's got worldly interests. And he's not going to bother with this guy's interests as well. He's got enough to worry about all by himself. Um, <clears throat> this is a... a, a a, a, sl a slave that has no interest in improving the circumstances for his master. Now let's take a look at the final verses 26 through 30. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will more be given and they will have an abundance. But whoever does not have uh, even what he has, well, whoever uh, uh, who does not have even what he has will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant or slave outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that doesn't sound fair. To give this man's bag of gold to the guy that's got ten? Well, wait a minute. That's starting to make more sense. If I was this master, what would I do with the bag of gold that had been buried in the ground? Well, I would do exactly what this master's doing. I would give it to the guy who's productive, 
and who is interested in what is of interest to me. This man is, I would give it to him because he's, he's interested in expanding my kingdom. He's interested in spreading my fame so that my glory and my renown might be known among the nations. Um, this man was interested with just a few things, but give him what this man had and give him even more. In, because to those who have been given much, much is required, but Scripture also says to, even, to them even more will be added. Well, where do you want to be in the story? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Lord, may I serve you with the amount of responsibility that you have given to the best of my ability. I mean, the clear application, I've got several here. Let me give you the one that's the main one. And that is that your life, brother, sister, listen to me now, your one solitary life has one goal, and only one if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You've only got one goal. Your task in life is to improve your master's assets. Your calling is to spread the fame of, of Jesus Christ, to glory in his name, to be busy serving the master. And that is your goal and delight, is to improve his kingdom while on earth, to expand it, to grow it, to be involved in any way possible, so that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, do it all for the glory of God. So that the raising of the children is an offering. And the marriage and the vows are an offering to the Lord. So that that rules out cheating. Uh, so, that, so that the job is an offering to the Lord as you honor your employer. And that rules out cheating. And, and your, your calling in life is to be a witness to your neighbor. And, and to see what you can do with your money in order to expand and further the kingdom of God so that your time and interests move in the direction of how to grow the church of Jesus Christ here on earth and to be as busy as you possibly can, not in silly work, but in honoring the Lord. And particularly when it comes to your own personal walk with Jesus. Brother, sister, your calling is to be more like Jesus so that the image of God is seen among the people. And they know that is the genuine article. That person has fallen in love with Christ. I can tell. By their fruit you shall know them. You know, brothers and sisters, we are saved by grace through faith and not of works. But the faith that saves is not without works. Show me your faith, I will show you works. Show me your works, and I will see your faith. And therefore, we don't believe in faith plus works equals salvation. It's faith alone. But the faith that saves is never, ever alone. Your calling? You've been entrusted with much, or perhaps little. But God has given you a ministry to sit at his feet. If you're old, you're infirm. You're unable to get out very much anymore. Pray, sister. Pray, brother. And offer up your days in your, in your disabilities. Offer them up to the Savior. Turn off the television and pray. The Lord's coming back very, very soon. A few more thoughts before we close. One is that Jesus, in this parable, is presupposing that, that you and I recognize our assigned roles, that we have tasks to perform, and that we will do them as unto the master. You know, this wicked slave thought his job was too hard, that this master was too difficult, hard to work with. These other two saw their assigned role as the most glorious opportunity, this treasure bequeathed to them in order that they might possess it and seek to serve the Lord with that which has been entrusted to them. You've been entrusted with, with spiritual blessing. 
What are you going to do with what the Master has given to you? Finally, let me say that we can never be passive. We have an obligation in this life to improve Christ's kingdom. There will be much opposition. The gates of hell will be trying to prevail. They will try to seek to overthrow, to close the doors of God's people and, their, and the church. And even if they open slightly, they will do what they can to impose their will upon God's people. But our people, the God's people, will be resistant to that and they will push forward for spiritual victories. And they will, we will push back against the enemies of the cross. We will fight a good fight. And we will keep the faith. We will fight hard for gospel truth. Brothers and sisters, do not worry about them who can kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. Rather, I tell you, fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. This wicked slave was cast into outer darkness. He was thrown into hell. I tell you, brothers and sisters, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God who's entrusted you with an opportunity to be busy and happily and joyfully serving uh, in his kingdom. God help us as a people, as a church, and those of us who are listening online, Give your life over to the service to the Master. Live for His glory. Honor the King. And await the glorious reward that awaits those who are faithful to the very end. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, how we thank you for this parable that teaches us of what is truly important. To lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust neither cause things to perish or fade where thieves do not break in and steal but today father take our lives and let them be wholly consecrated to you so that our relationships our use of time and giftedness our speech our conduct our efforts might be given over to increasing the fame and the territory of our great king so that his kingdom is ever expanding. Lord, at the very end, when we come to give an account, may we be able to present to you those who have come to Christ through our witness. May we be able to present to you a more sanctified life May we be able to present to you a life well lived. Oh Lord, spare us. Help us to not waste our Christian lives. Use us during the short time you've given us here before the Savior returns. And we will give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen.